While a teen girl was experiencing the worst day of her life, she had only one thought, to survive. When she chose to jump to safety, she had no idea she was solving two murders in doing so. She had just survived a brutal serial killer and would bring him to justice at only 16 years old. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna. But today's case is another survivor story that ended up being something that uncovered a whole string of unsolved murders and connecting them and putting it all on this one man who she could identify and ended up helping them catch. It's an incredible one and you guys know survivor stories are our thing on this channel. There's a whole playlist down below if you'd like to watch them. But I also want to thank our sponsor, Island Quest Away, a new app game with so much positive feedback already. You are actually helping Emily, you're the main character, search the island for her brother who mysteriously disappeared. It's perfect for any of us who like these sort of mysteries. I want to tell you more about the game though. Emily must sail to the island with her assistant Harrison, but the game actually starts with a shipwreck upon their arrival. You get to explore the beautiful locations with Emily to solve all of the strange mysteries and find treasures. You're also rebuilding the farm and getting to decorate as well as adopting adorable animals such as ostriches and alpacas and getting pets like a cute pink pony. There are even mini games within this game. While on the island, Emily actually finds that there was a lost civilization that was once living there with cutting edge technology and for unknown reasons, it fell to ruin. You get to help her find out what happened to them as well as discover their hidden treasure and find her missing brother. With the help of assistant Harrison, who isn't the most responsible man. It's absolutely incredible and so much fun. So if you want to play it, you can download it with my link down below or the QR code on the screen. And with my link, you'll end up getting 20 diamonds, 150 coins, and 230 energy points. So make sure to click that down below. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2016 in Michigan and Madison Nygaard was only 16 years old. She was still in high school and on April 16th, she was doing what normal teens do and she was actually going to a party. She had gone to Muskegon County and decided to actually walk home in the late night hours, early morning hours. And she found out that this party had been in a very rural area. There was not much around, no stores, not really even homes. And it lasted all night long. So by this time, it was pitch dark outside and Madison found herself without a ride. You see, her friends had fallen asleep in the car. He was drunk. He locked himself inside with the keys. And so she had no way to wake him or to ask him for a ride. And so she decided to go ahead and walk home. Now, the reason for this is she couldn't find a ride with anybody else and her phone also was not working to make phone calls because it needed Wi-Fi to do so. She knew she was on River Road and so she thought the walk home would be around 20 minutes and that she could do it easily. But after quite some time of walking, the sun started coming up and Madison realized she was lost. She was tired, she was aching, and she didn't know where to turn. There was nobody even on the roads to help. But around 9 a.m., Madison would see a silver minivan pull up next to her. And Madison would say that the man in the driver's seat was a older, nice looking man. She didn't know him, but he just asked her if she was okay. And also if she needed a ride. Now with Madison being a very smart girl, she did not want to get a ride from a stranger, but she did ask if she could use his phone. He ended up saying that she could use it, but there was a whole line at this point of cars who were finally coming down the road that were behind the van. And Madison said that he just said, hop in real quick, you can use my phone and then I'll let you out. She did so even though she felt in her gut that she shouldn't because she needed Needed help at this time and as soon as she did this man locked the doors and rolled up her window that had been down he began driving and a terrified madison was asking him can you roll back down my window i need some fresh air and he refused to do so that is when madison asked him well then can i use your phone like you said i could and he would tell her that his phone was dead that is when the 16 year old knew she was in trouble began to ask him if he would let her out of his car and that's when Madison said that this man's demeanor completely changed. That he was staring at her, saying nothing at all, was not answering her, and was giving her super creepy vibes is how she described it. Madison began to cry, begging him to stop and let her out. And that is when he reached under his seat 
and Madison would see him pulling out a gun. She thought she was going to die and she knew that she would have to save her own life. Madison said she didn't have a plan. She just quickly unlocked the door and threw herself out of the moving van. She jumped, landing on the cement, having injuries all over her body, but she got up immediately and began running because she knew that her life depended on it. When she looked back, the man had stopped the van, had gotten out of the van, and began to point that gun at her while she was running. Once again, she thought she was going to die, and so she was running as fast as she could, and she noticed that because the man had driven a little ways, there were actually houses around the area that hadn't been there before that she could ask for help. So she ran to the nearest house and she was asking to get in, saying that somebody was trying to kidnap her. And at the same time, this man was saying that it was actually all a joke, that everything was just a joke. So the woman led her inside her home, immediately called 911 for Madison, and Madison was rushed to the hospital for her injuries. It was found that her, especially her back and arms were injured, they had scrapes, and they were missing a lot of the skin from the jump because she had jumped from a vehicle that was moving pretty fast. Thankfully, Madison was conscious and she remembered every detail. So she began to tell investigators what the van looked like, what the man looked like, and what the gun looked like look like she remembered everything and she did so while she was recovering and i was just screaming and i was like he has a gun please let me in she also remembered that the gun had some sort of orange cap at the tip now she believed that maybe this was an airsoft gun at first when she saw it but then it was you know still terrifying to have this gun and she thought you know either way this man is pointing a gun at me and so that's why she ended up jumping but she gave investigators the location where she had jumped from the moving van so investigators decided to go back to this area and that is when they would find two live 22 caliber rounds on the ground it appeared as though this gun wasn't an airsoft gun, this was a real gun, and this man had tried to shoot Madison twice. However, in some sort of miracle, the gun had jammed. Next, they went looking for surveillance cameras throughout the whole route that Madison was taken on, and they were able to see this exact van drive by. And because of the image, they were able to go to the database for the vehicles, and they found 30,000 similar vehicles in the area. However, they ended up narrowing it down to 31, and those 31 owners were located. And so a few weeks after Madison had jumped from that van, they put these owners into a lineup for Madison to choose from. And though Madison would have her own choice in who did this to her, obviously, in picking it out, investigators actually already had the prime suspect or who they believed it to be because they went to every single one of these 31 vans, checked it out, and one of them matched perfectly. The van and the owner that they had picked was the same one that Madison would choose. Now on May 17th of 2016, a month later, the man Madison chose would be brought in for questioning after being tracked for a week and finally pulled over and arrested. Now during that time, they were watching very suspicious behavior. Like one point he went into a parking lot, didn't ever go inside. He just kind of roamed around as though he was watching people. They feared that he was looking for his next victim and they began to follow him even closer to make sure that he didn't hurt anyone else before they could arrest him. When they finally did arrest him, he completely denied even knowing Madison. Regardless, he was arrested for the abduction. A search warrant for his home and his van were obtained at this point. And also while he was in jail, he made a phone call to a man named Sean Stefanich, who was a cop. Listen, I've been arrested. I'm down at the jail, and I need you to go get Char. I need you to tell Char that she needs to either come down and I don't know what's going on. So, um, and then I need you to go make sure Hank is okay, I guess. Apparently, they're at the house, and uh, they did my van and all kinds of shit. So, did you do that for me? Where's Char at? I don't know what's going on. I have not talked to her since yesterday at 8 o'clock. And I need, uh, apparently I'm going to need a lawyer. So, if you could think of a good one. All right. You, you know Al Swanson? I know Al, but I don't know how good he is. I don't, uh, I don't know how good he is either. First thing you got to do is you got to get out. And the problem is, is more than likely you're going to have to wait till you see the judge. 
and you won't be able to see the judge until they get all the warrant paperwork down there. So that'll be later on today. Uh, how long does it usually take? You're probably about 2, 3 o'clock later today, which is in, you know, 3, 4 hours. Work tonight. Inside the home, investigators would find a paper. This paper had multiple names of serial killers on it. Now, there was especially two names that were circled, and that was Lawrence Bittaker and Roy Norris, the toolbox killers. Infamous serial killers in 1979 who had kidnapped, raped, tortured, and murdered five teenage girls in California. Investigators began to speculate that this man's motives had stemmed from the crimes of these other men, especially when they searched in his van and they would find a toolbox with a padlock. After breaking it open, they would find what they would describe as a murder kit. This had a camera, handcuffs, rope, chains, drugs, a knife, 22 caliber, gun, and much more. And the ammunition found inside this van matched the ammunition found where Madison had escaped. Investigators believed that this was a moving torture van and that this man had done this before. Especially when, inside of his home, investigators found hundreds of videos and photos of women being abducted, raped, and killed. But they couldn't tell if these were homemade or if these were from a different source. Now, upon hearing that this man likely did not just kidnap this one girl, investigators began looking into similar cases. And that is when they found that a silver van was thought to be involved in another crime. You see, three years prior to this, around the same area in Michigan, another abduction had occurred. This was April 26th of 2013, when 25-year-old Jessica Haringa had vanished. She was a mother to a three-year-old son named Zevin, and she wanted to give him a better life. Her plan was to go to college and become an accountant. And at the time, she was engaged to her son's father named Dakota. Jessica actually worked at the Exxon gas station in Norton Shores, Michigan, and she was said to be quite popular with the customers there. They knew who she was. They relied on her to be in there to talk to. And that night, Jessica was working. She was going to close up around 11.30 p.m. And the register would show that her last customer was at 10.55 when they purchased a lighter. By 11.07 p.m., a customer had gone inside to purchase some gas and he knew that someone was normally there, but he couldn't find anyone. He went searching around the store and eventually called 911 because he realized that a car was there as well as a purse but there was no one else there. There was money still inside the cash register. There was money still inside her purse. This was not a robbery. And looking closer outside of the gas station, kind of in the back area, they found what they believed was a drop of blood, a little more than a drop of blood, as well as a battery cover. It was a Walther battery cover, and this particular brand will come into play later on. While the police were there investigating, the store's manager ended up arriving for the morning shift and she was speaking to police and that's when she told them she might have actually witnessed something that night. You see, she lived in the area and she had gone on a motorcycle ride with her husband. They had ridden past the gas station around 11 p.m. and the manager noticed that there was this car. She believed it was a silver van and they turned off their headlights and they pulled around the back area where normal delivery drivers would park and no one was scheduled to be there. It was also not a delivery van. And so they kind of pulled closer to get a better look to check it out. And that is when they saw what they believed to be a man at the back of the van who shut the door, then he opened it and then he shut it really fast again. Then he got in the car and he drove off. And when he was driving off, that is when they could actually see him in the driver's seat. Now it turned out this delivery area where the manager was speaking of was where that blood was found and they would do DNA tests and it would be identified as Jessica's blood. The manager though ended up being quite helpful in the case. Like I said, she had seen this man and so while they were searching for clues and for Jessica, she was working with a sketch artist to try to identify the driver. Now she claimed that he had this wild blonde looking hair, but even with the sketch, for months, 
no one knew what happened to Jessica. Theories were emerging that she had a tumultuous life, that her interest in other men besides her husband or her fiance got her in trouble, or that she had a desire to run away due to her fiance's controlling behavior, or that it was drug use and that she was selling drugs. And there was a journal entry that allegedly talked about her fiance's not so great behavior and why she would want to run away. And so one of the big theories was that her fiance Dakota was involved. However, he was quickly ruled out due to phone records proving that he was at home with their son the night of the disappearance. Another widespread theory had to do with the men that Jessica was allegedly cheating on him with or were friends with. There was no proof showing that she had any infidelity, but her sister said that she was a very friendly girl and that a lot of guys would get the wrong idea because of this and they would take it to the next level when she didn't want that. And there was a man in particular named Jess Ammerman, a 37-year-old plumbing contractor who was also married. When police questioned him, he said he was at the gas station that night, but he was there around 9.30. However, once he explained why he was there and his relationship with Jessica, it kind of gave him a motive. He was saying that he was actually going to leave his wife because he loved Jessica, but Jessica had gotten cold feet. He claimed that he went there that night to talk to her. She still had cold feet, and so he drove to a parking lot and ended up talking to his wife on the phone for the next day hour. Now, phone records did confirm that he was on the phone, but that meant it would have only been until around 10.30 p.m., whereas it was believed Jessica was abducted around 11 p.m. Now, this man's wife was questioned, and she actually knew that her husband was in this relationship and was allegedly okay with it. But both Jess and his wife were given polygraph tests, and the results have never been revealed to the public that I could find, and her body was not located nor was her possible killer at this point. The months turned into a full year and little did investigators know that after that year, this monster would strike again because the next time he would attack was not with Madison who survived. You see, Rebecca Bletch was a 36-year-old mother to a 12-year-old girl and had been married for 18 years. She was known to be the life of the party. She had so many friends. She worked as a physical therapist assistant and she was motherly, reliable, tender-hearted, according to her family and friends. But she would be found deceased on June 29th of 2014 in Dalton Township, Michigan. And this was around 20 minutes from where Jessica had disappeared. She was found shot three times in the head. She had on her workout clothes and it was believed that she was actually on a run the time of her murder and that she had just been shot dead where she was running. And next to her was actually a pile of her sunglasses, earbuds, and Apple Watch. Now, Rebecca's daughter and her husband were actually out of town camping at this time, though it was theorized that her husband, Kevin, still had something to do with this anyways. And Kevin had always denied this, saying that they had just bought a camper for retirement, they were excited for their future, and that she really had no fears of anyone because she didn't have any enemies. No one had seen this murder occur. In fact, the couple that ended up calling the police believed that she had been hit by a car and this was a hit and run. We come up to this lady, she's laying in the road. I think she was hit by a car. Okay. She's got a head injury. Is she she's unconscious? In the road. Yes, she is. Okay. You stay on the phone with me. Is she breathing? She is breathing. She has a pulse. Okay. Did you see who hit her? Does she have obvious injuries? She has a head injury. She's laying face down. Okay, don't move her around, okay? Yep. She by herself? You need to hurry. She's all by herself. Really irregular. My wife is a nurse. You need to hurry. Okay, sir, they're on the way already, okay? Did anybody see anything? She's got a really bad head injury. She's, she's okay. bleeding, bleeding quite quite a bit from her head. Okay, we got to start CPR if she's not... If she's not breathing normally, I want you to go ahead and start. We're not going to hurt her anymore. Oh, she's making funny noises. Okay. I do this. Okay, that's fine. You're not going to hurt her if she's not breathing. Just go ahead with the chest compressions. Let's get that blood through her. Where is somebody? Well, who can hit a woman and just leave her? The autopsy revealed that she was killed just minutes before she was found by the couple, and the weapon was believed to be a 22 caliber gun just like in the abduction of Madison. And so now with all three possibly connected, they began to look into the gun and the purchase of this particular gun. And they found that it actually was purchased with a Walther laser sight, which had this battery cover. The same one found 
in the parking lot of Jessica's disappearance. It was theorized that the laser sight had broken off when he had used it against Jessica to get her inside the car or to kill her. And they now believe they had official evidence to connect them all. Even though for the past two years, Rebecca's case had gone unsolved and for the past three, Jessica's had. Because now the same gun was found in the suspect's minivan. The man now being charged with the possible murder of two women and the abduction of another, his name was Jeffrey Willis. He was a 46-year-old forklift driver at the Herman Miller Furniture Manufacturing Store, and he had no criminal record. Though just before Madison escaped, he was actually under surveillance because there was a complaint that there was a man in a silver van stalking women in parking lots. And he was also friends with that cop he called from jail, Sean Stefanich. There was a possibility that this Jeffrey had used Sean Stefanich's cabin that he had in Mancelona, Michigan, which was two hours and 15 minutes away from where Jessica vanished, to bury her body. Neighbors of that cabin claimed that they had seen Jeffrey at the cabin many times and they saw him taking a shovel into the woods as well. While investigators searched the cabin, they searched the woods around the area, they did come up empty. But Sean was not the only person in law enforcement that Jeffrey had around him. You see, his cousin was Kevin Bloom, who was a prison sergeant and who he was very close with at the time. We'll get into a little bit more of what Kevin knew in a bit. But Jeffrey was said to take his grandfather out to eat every single week. He worked normal jobs throughout his life. He was quite popular in high school. He was an almost too confident guy, especially around girls, according to the people who knew him. He thought very highly of himself. And in his 30s, as he had grown, he was able to talk to anyone and he would do anyone any favor. However, even though many had good things to say about him, looking back, some began to come forward to say that he wasn't as nice as everybody thought he was. And many said that he would make crude comments about women's body parts though he was married but what jeffrey told the police was that with madison he now knew who she was and he said that he was trying to help a distraught looking girl find her way home but that when he rolled the windows up she began to freak out and before he could stop her she was jumping out of the car now for quite some time in this case madison was actually referred to by her initials mgn due to the fact that she was a minor so you might come across that if you do research yourself however since then she has said she doesn't mind being identified she's a little bit older now and she has gone on to the stand and testified, which we'll get into. How certain are you that this is the man who Oh, hundred percent. I know it's him. And nobody knows, nobody would have known that that happened to me. Nobody knew that I started walking. Nobody knew anything. I could have just been gone just like her. But on Jeffrey's computer, investigators had found a folder named VIX, short for victims. Or that was what it was believed to be. And inside that folder was another folder named Jessica Harrington, and another named Rebecca Blitch. Inside were photos of them. Inside Rebecca's folder was also news articles about her death and a photo that looked like Rebecca wearing a bikini and lying on a bed. There were many videos found as well that was referred to as murder porn. One was of a woman jogging before she was killed, just like Rebecca. Now, once Jeffrey was arrested, a neighbor of his came forward to say that he had actually once asked to use their bathroom and ended up filming their underage 14-year-old girls, their daughters. And they would later say that they always felt uncomfortable with him, that he was always watching them, but they didn't think he would do anything like this. And that is when investigators would find photos of them from all through the years and all different locations on his computer. He was stalking these two girls. He was charged with production and possession of child pornography for this. However, he wouldn't actually be tried for that. And while awaiting trial, Jeffrey's cousin, who was the prison sergeant named Kevin Bloom, was arrested on June 21st of 2016. He was charged with lying to police about Rebecca and Jessica's murders and being an accessory after the fact. He allegedly saw the body of Jessica after her murder and helped to bury her. He said that Jeffrey called him. He then arrived to find this body, but Jeffrey had then told him that he had been following and watching Jessica and he hit her and she fell unconscious. He then used sex toys and tortured her. And so when Kevin arrived, he said that Jessica was face down, tied up, naked and not moving. 
They then allegedly wrapped her in a sheet, buried her in a hole that was actually already dug. But the reason they were looking into Kevin was because he allegedly reset his phone the day after Jeffrey was charged with Rebecca's murder. But Kevin claimed that he only reset his phone due to explicit photos and videos. But he also admitted that he knew Rebecca before her murder, that they were friends and that he was an honest guy and wouldn't have killed her himself. He said that two years after the murder, he was handling the gun used in her murder because Jeffrey wanted to get rid of the gun, but he said he wouldn't do it. Now on November 2nd of 2017, Jeffrey Willis went to trial and he took the stand for the murder of Rebecca Bletch. And he was saying that he was innocent. He was at home cutting grass during that time and that his wife could verify it. However, she refused to do so. And it was announced that the believed motive for the murder of Rebecca was that she had refused to get into the van when Jeffrey had told her to, and because of that, he killed her. A DNA expert testified that Rebecca's DNA was found on the sex toy and glove inside the toolbox. Now he was found guilty in the murder of Rebecca Bletch and he was sentenced to life without parole. <laughs> I think that was very cowardly to walk out like that and then to turn around to my family and blow a kiss like I said I think that's his kiss of death he's gonna get what he deserves in prison during this trial he refused to listen to the victim impact statements and because of this a bill was actually passed by the Michigan Senate that required convicted defendants to listen this is now known as the Rebecca Bletch law we lost our sister there's no closure it that empty spot is always going to be there. The facts will show he's a brutal madman. I tell him that as far as I'm concerned, he's a useless individual. January 2008, his prison sergeant, cousin Kevin Bloom, was sentenced to five years probation after pleading no contest to being an accessory. In May of 2018, it was the trial for Jessica's disappearance and believed murder. Now, his defense attorney said that there was no real evidence that Jeffrey was ever alone with Jessica or that he did anything to her that someone possibly killed her after she sold them drugs and Jeffrey was pleading not guilty and the prosecution claimed that Jeffrey had killed her, that he had struck her inside the gas station or outside of the gas station, put her in the back of his van and took her and killed her. And that his motive was that he was living out his fantasy that was displayed all over his computer. Once Jeffrey was arrested, Witnesses had come forward to say that Jeffrey was at the gas station the night of Jessica's murder, not just outside. He at one point was inside flirting with her. He was then MIA from work that night. When you walked in to the gas station, uh, did you recognize who was working that particular night? Yes. Who? It was Jessica. And uh, when you walked into the gas station that night, was Jessica alone? No. Who else was there? Jeffrey Willis. What makes it so sure in your mind that it was Mr. Willis? Um, because he looked right at me because I was having a conversation with Jessica about her being there by herself at night. And that I'd have, you know, if I was her, I'd have her husband or boyfriend or whoever come down and stay with her the last hour to make sure she was all right. And she said, he turned around, looked at me and said that she's got her customers looking out for her too. The final customer that night who had bought the lighter came forward and would testify that the night she was there, there was also a man in the store that made her feel super uneasy. However, she said that man wasn't Jeffrey. I was afraid of him. His proxemics were very poor. I felt that Jessica was alone, shouldn't have been. It was always in the evening. This person, just a character, judgment. I felt it, it just wasn't safe. But it turned out that all the way back in 2013, a week after Jessica's disappearance, a tip called in about Jeffrey Willis. This drive through worker had seen this man in the silver van and they believed that he could have done this based on the evidence that was being presented to the public at the time. Jeffrey was allegedly questioned at that time all the way back in 2013 and told them he was at the gas station around 5 p.m. but that he didn't know Jessica and he didn't go back after that. 
they did end up looking at his van at that time and they found that it was spotless. There were vacuum marks and it smelled like cleaning products. However, this was said not to be documented in an official report until 2017 when these other murders and abductions had occurred. This was just kept in the officer's notes until this time. Now, Jessica's fiance, Dakota, would testify too. Are you going through trouble? Uh, we had issues with other people, just jealousy issues, I guess. Okay, what do you mean? What other people? She always suspected me of being with somebody else. I always suspected her of her trying to see someone else. Infidelity, I guess, is the word I'm looking for. No one specific, just general, I don't know how to explain it. Do you know who she was seeing for drugs? I do not know him personally. I just know he went by a street named Jay-Z. That's all. I've never met the person. I've never seen him. I called him and cussed him out on the phone that one day, and that was it. And that Jessica was using heroin. Now, the survivor, Madison Nygaard, would also take the stand against her captor, and she broke down in tears in the courtroom that day. And she gave the same story as she had given to police years prior. Madison's mother was there and was said to reach out to Rebecca and Jessica's families and hug them tight during the trial while the crime scene photos were shown. Then Jeffrey's ex-wife testified against him saying that they were married for 13 years, but around 2013 when Jessica was abducted, he began to change his appearance. He lost quite a bit of weight. He highlighted his hair. And around that same time, he purchased a silver minivan. Appearance today, is it the same as it was back in 2013? No, but significantly different. Significantly different? Yes. How so? Um, he has uh, lost quite a bit of weight. He was near 300 pounds, and he always had his hair cut about every three weeks, so it was very short, and he kept his beard trimmed or his goatee trimmed. Okay. Recall... Uh, a time in 2013 when two Norton Shores police officers came to your house? Yes. And, and how, how is it that you remember that? I was inside with the dogs at the time and looked out the front blinds and the van doors were open, the trunk was open. Okay, so when you had seen, uh, the, the, this is your first observation of them? Yes. Okay. And, and um, at any point in time, ma'am, uh, did you uh, get an opportunity to talk to them? No. Were, were you made aware at all, either by the officers themselves or the defendant, that the officers wanted to talk to you? No. Uh, were you told by the defendant, hey, look, I just had this conversation with a couple of police officers and you may want to call them? So, no. Nope. Any conversation at all? No. You've never seen this toolbox? Nope. Part of his murder kit also allegedly had insulin in it and syringes, and these were from her because she had diabetes. She said she had no idea he was stealing them from her. But then Jeffrey Willis took the stand again, and he started talking about helping Madison. But then he slipped up because he was saying that he was just helping her and that when he tried to pull up and help her, she wasn't where he needed her to be. Be. and a lot of people caught on to that. He also claimed that the reason that he had this list of serial killers was because after Jessica's disappearance, a coworker was talking to him about it and believed that it was a serial killer and he was just trying to help. And, but on May 16th of 2018, he was found guilty of the murder of Jessica Herringer. Now, although Kevin had allegedly told the police where they buried the body, Jessica's body has still not been found. But investigators do not believe that this is all that Jeffrey did. In fact, he was suspected to be involved in the 1996 murder of a 15-year-old named Angela Marie Thornburg. She had vanished in September of 1996 in Fruitport and was thought to be a runaway. But it was 13 minutes away from the gas station where Jessica had disappeared 17 years later. And if he was involved in that case, had he been doing this for those 17 years? A month after Angela had vanished, her body was found partially clothed in the woods and there were no signs of trauma according to investigators, but it was not reported how she died. 
but they believe he might have been connected because Jeffrey had gone to the same Fruitport High School back in 1988, but during the time that Angela was going to that high school, he was working there as a janitor. Three years after her murder, he would be fired from that school because he was looking at explicit images on the computer. It's unknown how many victims that Jeffrey took the lives of, how many people really knew who he was. Rebecca's family did make a statement against Jeffrey's cousin, Kevin Bloom, saying that his silence about the entire thing killed. That if he had spoken up earlier about Jessica's abduction and murder, Rebecca would still be alive. Rebecca's father said that Jeffrey was a rat in a trap doing everything that he could to get out of it. The survivor who caught a serial killer, Madison Nygaard, said that she went 16 years without ever experiencing anxiety or PTSD, but after this encounter with a serial killer, she says it's all she ever deals with. But she says she's glad she's able to put him behind bars and she wants young girls to remember to be safe, that they are not invincible. Due to her bravery that day, two victims and their families received justice and a monster was taken off the streets. Though her abduction was never officially charged, she was essential to the trials of Jessica and Rebecca. Jessica's family then went to the Michigan House of Representatives and created Jessica's law to require gas stations that open from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. to install surveillance cameras because there were none at the gas station she worked at. And her case almost went unsolved because there wasn't anything to prove that she had even been taken other than that blood found. On March 11th of 2020, this bill was passed. Well, do you believe there were more victims of Jeffrey Willis? How did he get away with this behavior for so long? How did people not see the signs and the strange behavior? Or did they and did they ignore it? I think that this case is probably much bigger and much deeper than we know or that we will ever know. And I believe that one of the lawyers or investigators had said that Jeffrey is not one who is going to tell names of his victims. He's not going to be one that comes up with the names and gives them all the information if they don't have it. So really, they were, they were looking into all sorts of unsolved cases around the area, but who knows if we'll ever know his other victims. Please send so much love to Madison, the survivor, and the victims' families down below. And don't forget to download Island Quest Away if you want to help Emily find her missing brother in a very fictional world, I should say. So don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough, and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay.